So, of course, I am not going to give you a course on uh, uh, random variables or probability theory or arithmetic function, but I would like that more or less we agree on what we are talking about. So, this will be this uh, introductory chapter on basic notions. Okay, let us start with arithmetic function. Do not hesitate to interrupt and uh, to ask for more. So essentially, arithmetic function is anything you like. Is the best way to, to do that. Uh, so an arithmetic function is simply a complex sequence. If you wish, you can see it as a map from the integers, positive integers, to the complex numbers. And uh, what is interesting is that they may have some arithmetic property. For example, it is said an arithmetic, so we say that f, so in some way let us say this would be f, seeing that the map, it is more convenient because if you put everything as indices, then you have something which is really messy. So we say that f is additive. If you have the following, that uh, uh, each time m and n are co-prime, the GCD is equal to 1. This implies that f of m times n, this is multiplication here, is f of m plus f of n. We've been speaking about, speaking about uh, uh, number of divisors, for example, little omega, capital omega, those are definitely uh, additive function and uh, multiplicative if you have the same blah 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 except that here it is the product. Okay? So it is definitely it is, it is definitely connected even if it is additive it's not additive number theory. It is definitely connected with the fact that f of mn is f of m, f of n, whenever m and n are co-prime. And uh, you can see that this means that indeed f of n, I'm not going to write it, is the sum over the prime power divisors of m, p to alpha divides exactly m, of f of p to the alpha, or the product of those. I don't insist on that. If really one or two of you have some questions, we'll can, you can raise questions after. But I think there is no difficulty. It's more to be, to, to be sure what we are saying. And f is said to be strongly additive. This is the case of the little omega function if we have the following that for any alpha and for any p, f of p to the alpha is equal to f of p. I guess you understand that alpha is a non-negative integer and p a prime number. Usually, I use P only for prime numbers. We are not dealing with LP spaces, so it's fine. Okay? So, uh, we have some examples. Capital omega, the number, total number of prime with multiplicity is additive, but the little omega is strongly additive, and, uh, and so on. Multiplicative, the phi function, Euler function is multiplicative, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to... To, to spend too much time on that. Essentially, the only thing we will use about the distribution of prime number is not much. Distribution of prime numbers is Merton's theorem. We already used it. Merton's theorem, which says that summation when p is up to x of 1 over p is something which is log log x plus constant plus little 1. Okay. You can see it as a consequence of uh, the prime number theorem, but it is easier. 
You see, before people knew how to, pr well, essentially, prime number was in the air, air during all the uh, 19th century. It has been conjectured by Gauss and Legendre at the beginning of the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, and proved only by uh, Adam Arendt de la Vallée Poussin at the end of the 19th century. So in between, people tried to, to go around and say what yeah, they could see, and this is one of the results that was obtained. Okay. So some general definition for us, which is now for arithmetic function, the mean value. So okay, mean value. We say that the arithmetical function f as a mean value uh, if the limit m of f is equal to the limit when n tends to infinity of 1 over n summation n up to capital N of f of n exists. And of course the mean value is the value of the limit, as you, can, uh, as you can imagine. This is not the case, for example, for the little omega function. Okay, little omega is tending to infinity or mean value which would behave as log log, but it's not strictly a mean value. Okay? And the uh, definition of what we have seen with the function uh, little omega, we said that little omega for almost all n, it really looks like the function log log n. So this is what we call a normal or no order. So we say that an arithmetic function g is a normal order is a normal order for f if there exists a subset on the integer, a sequence, let us say n of the integers such that we have two things. One thing is that this set is rather huge. That is to say that 1 over x, uh, the cardinality of the n belonging to n and which are less than x, this tends to 1. You just let aside only little o of x element up to x. And the second point is that f is really looking like uh, g. If there exists a sequence yeah, uh, such that uh, 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 j uh, is there, f of n is equal to 1 plus little of 1 g of n as n belong to n, n tends to infinity. Okay? So now there is something that you can say immediately that a function f has always a normal order. What can you find as a normal order for f? If the mean value exists. Hmm? Oh, no, not always. Not always the mean value. This is something different. Uh, <laughs> if, even if you, you accept for mean value something tending to infinity, we saw this morning, for those who couldn't come, that uh, the function, the, distrib the uh, divisor function has a mean value which is of the size log n but a normal order which is more or less something like log n to the power log 2. Smaller. No, no, this is not the case. G is equal to f. So, uh, the first definition that was given by Hardy Ramanujan was something a bit to say, okay, we don't want to, to have this trivial thing, so we are asking for what? For a function which should be monotonic can be decreasing or increasing, it is monotonic and it is expressed only with uh, usual functions. Then exactly what does it mean? For example, you see, when w what we were saying is that if you take the function little omega, we said that log log n is a normal order for omega, this means something, 
but uh, if you try to say, oh, we, we, we want to avoid trivial things, you get into something which is even more complicated. So some will be trivial, some will be non-trivial, that's it. Okay, but normal order is this one. Okay. Uh, good, I think I, I shift now to probability, always in the basic things. You're right, it is a, in some way it is a good guess to say the, the mean value should be a good, uh, a good guess for that and usually it is for additive functions, but uh, not always. One, two, uh, so basic knowledge. I guess you can find all that in Rudin on, prob uh, on probability theory. Look at Rudin and you find what you, what you need. But better we, we agree on what we are doing. So probability measure. So okay, definition. First of all, what is a probability space? So a probability space, you have an unempty space. And then you want to measure some part of it. So... Uh, probability space. Is the data of omega. Omega is non-empty space. Non-empty set. Capital tau is a sigma algebra of subsets of omega. That means the following that it contains all the set and it is stable when you take complementary set, when you take countable unions, when you take countable intersections and go on like that and it is closed for those things. For example, the parts of omega itself. So for us, I mean if you want to do real probability it's important. This notion is very important because all the, all the timing you may have will depend on whether something is measurable with respect to a certain sigma algebra. But for what we are doing, we are not doing anything with process, uh, uh, random process. So for us, we can imagine that tau is always p of omega and this is fine. Okay, so tau a sigma algebra. Sigma algebra it means I am not going to write everything you, you find it in books, but it means what I was saying. Hmm? It is stable by a certain thing, sigma algebra of parts of omega. And uh, of course the probability measure, and P is a map. Do you know what is a measure? Think of, a, of it really as a measure. Is a map from tau to the uh, interval 0, 1. And you have some condition, it is a positive measure with total mass is equal to 1. Essentially what you need, so that it is a positive measure, it's already said that when you measure a set, you always got get into 0, 1. So it is positive measure. And what you need is that such that you have the following. One is that the probability of all the set is 1. No problem by definition of sigma algebra, omega is in the sigma algebra. And uh, the second one is that you have a bit more than additivity. Additivity would be that if you have two sets which are disjoint, then the probability of the union is the sum of the probability. This is true not only for finite set, but also for a countable family of sets. So if you have a i, i belongs to n, are um, pair, no, uh, yes, pairwise, it's fine, pairwise um, uh, elements, distinct, pairwise distinct elements of 
tau, then the probability of the union of Ei, no problem, yep. Yeah, disjoint, disjoint, thank you, yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah, disjoint. Disjoint elements of tau, then the, of course the union is also in that because this is sigma algebra and uh, this will be just the sum, the series of the probability of the AI. Okay, among other, it is additive, but it's more than additive. It is sigma additive. Good. Okay, so now some consequences which are basic, that it is increasing. If you have two elements your, from your sigma algebra A, which is included in B, then the probability of A is at most equal to the probability of B. Just do what you have to do with that. And uh, what else? Uh, if you have a set which is increasing, a family which is increasing of AI, then the probability of the union is the limit of the probability of the element. And this, by the way, can be taken as a good equivalent for that. Okay, all that is basic. You look into, if you know it, it's fine. If you don't know it, you just go into some basic books. But uh, uh, this is not too bad. Let us give some uh, examples. Very important for us is the direct measure. So you take some omega, so, uh, well, many things are called omega, I'm sorry. Omega is now a set for uh, probability side, and little omega is an element in omega. Then the measure delta omega, indeed you can even define it from any part of omega. This is not too difficult. It goes into 0, 1, either 0 or 1, and to a part of A, it associates something which is 0 if omega does not belong to A, and 1 if omega belongs to A. Okay, it's uh, in some way sort of dual version of the um, uh, indicator of A. Okay, this is fine. What do we need? Well, maybe maybe this I can. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. Just a, a remark, I said example, so this is one. Another one is the following. If you consider a family, I take finite family. P1, Pn, a family of probability measure on omega tau and e1 en be non-negative integer with sum of ai is equal to 1 then uh, the sum of a1 P, AI PI. What it is, it means simply that what you do is when you have any set A, of course they are acting on the same measurable, measurable space. So this is to A, you will associate something which is the sum of AI PI of A. Okay? It's again a probability measure. This is clear. This is interesting. For example, if you start with measures which are direct measure, what you get is something that way, something which is called an atomic measure. Uh, and also you will have something which is a decomposition. Maybe you have seen that. I don't think we have time to say more, at least in the course, about the Lebesgue decomposition, that uh, you can decompose a measure into something which is continuous and something which is atomic. And what is continuous can be absolutely continuous. In a general omega, you don't know what it means, but in R, you, you know what it means, and so on. Well, OK. Uh, I think I have to go on. And uh, last things, maybe, on probability space, to, to say the definition that two elements, what we called here events, that is to say A and B, 
in tau, this is what we call events, it is just an element of tau, are said to be independent if probability of their intersection is the product of their probability. It has nothing to do with the fact that uh, the elements are disjoint, the fact that they are independent. And by the way, even if they are disjoint, usually they are not independent. Because then this is probability of the empty set, which is 0, 1 minus blah, blah. And uh, this is 0, and this usually is different from 0. So two disjoint sets are not independent. Be careful of that. Okay. So, but we are not going to work too much on uh, on the probability space for themselves. Uh, just one thing that uh, maybe I'll say it a bit later, or yeah, maybe I can say it immediately. No, because it is better to say it in R. Okay. So. 1 to 2, it is real probability measure. And what is very important for us is distribution function. So if we go to the real uh, state, it is easier. Now, there is one question is, what can we take as being uh, the um, uh, sigma algebra? So, you have two categories of people. One category say, I like the axiom of choice. If you like the axiom of choice, then you say it is impossible that all the parts of, uh, of uh, are, are uh, measurable. This is not that good. But you have also some other people on the side of Soloway who is telling you that, well, forget about cho choice axiom. At least you can keep the countable cho choice axiom. You know, choice axiom tells you the following. If you have a family of non-empty sets, then their product is non-empty. Well, OK, if you can keep, forget about that in general, keep it at least for the enumerable countable set, this is fine. And then you say, I forget about the axiom of choice, but I put something which is every part of R is measurable, and then you are happy, you have something which is more or less consistent with the zermelo frankel More or less. But, uh, so, for us, it's clear that we are not going to make anything subtle about uh, sigma algebra. The sigma algebra in R is equal to P of R. Full stop. So, okay, for us, what it is a real probability measure, probability measure on R is a map from uh, P of R to the set uh, zero 01, the interval, closed interval zero 01, such that uh, such that what uh, R P of R the map let us say P P is a probability space. If you don't like it, use your usual thing. In any case, in R, in R you have a rich structure, you have a topology. So in any case, be sure that all the closed interval, open interval, intersection of them, countable, inter countable union, everything is inside that. All the Borel sets. Okay. So this is what you what you have to do in any case. Good. Now, what is interesting is that whether you are Borel sets or that, you can always do something which is to measure the interval from minus infinity to 
a real number t. Okay. So, okay. Uh, definition, yes. Definition. Let p be a probability measure. On R, no point to say that it is R with this uh, sigma algebra. Uh, the function from R to zero one, which associate to a number t the probability of the interval minus infinity t, closed in t. Everybody agrees now what is to take this as being closed here. Okay? If you look at very old books, you may find it also with open set, but uh, I think everybody agrees now on that. So you have this function. This function is called the distribution function fp of p. Okay. So what you have done so far is to say, okay, probability. You see something a bit messy because you are looking at all the parts of R. In any case, in a sigma algebra, which can be rather large and you are associating to ele every element uh, its, uh, its value in 0, 1. Here you are just considering those elements. And what is very nice is that this is, it completely characterizes the probability measure p. This is very nice. Okay? So let us do the following proposition. Be the following, let p be a probability measure on R. It's not good to write abbreviation, but uh, otherwise we are here tomorrow evening. Okay. Then FP is what? It need not be a continuous function. You see, if you think of the direct measure, if you think of the direct measure, there will be a jump. Okay? If you have direct measure at zero, then up to zero, you will get something which is uh, zero. And then starting from zero, you will get something which is equal to one. Just you have to say whether zero is in this interval or not. Okay? So there may be a jump. It need not be continuous. In any case, it is monotonic. It is increasing, non decreasing. It's non decreasing because. You see, if t1 is, is less than t2, then this set up to t2 is larger. And if the set is larger, then the probability is larger. So it is a non-decreasing function with values, of course, in 0, 1. So you know, if you have a bounded, non-decreasing function, it's something which is rather nice. Yes, the, the number of points where it jumps is at most countable and in each point you have a limit on the left and a limit on the right. And this one is right continuous. A non-decreasing function with values in the one, it is always right continuous. This is the question of uh, the, the limit of the union or the limit of the intersection of element. You take something which are all the intervals t plus epsilon and you take their intersection and then their intersection will be this closed interval and so it is continuous from the right. Because this probability will be the limit of the other probability. Okay, so it is continuous from the right and, uh, and uh, what else? And also, you have the following thing that the limit when t tends to minus infinity of fp of t, this is equal to zero. Same thing. 
You take the intersection of this when t is tending to zero, the intersection will be the empty set. But it has to be the limit of this. And in the similar way, the limit when t tends to plus infinity of fp of t is equal to 1. OK? Good. So this is the first part in some way of the proposition. But now what is really interesting is that if you have a function which satisfies that, it completely characterizes the probability measure. There always exists a probability measure, and it's completely characterized by that. So now we can see that the probability measures on R, we can see them just as functions, through the distribution functions. Uh, I don't know about you, but for me it makes life much easier. I prefer to see a function than to see something which is defined on a, on a big mess. Okay? So what is interesting is that let f be a right continuous function, be a right continuous non-decreasing function on R. which satisfies these two conditions, that the limit at minus infinity is 0, the limit at plus infinity is 1, then there exists a probability, a unique if you wish even, unique probability, unique probability measure on R. Said that fp is equal to f. Uh, probability measure p on r. Said so that this distribution is f. Okay? Good. Now you, there is something you know how to do. You have seen measures which are associated, or if you have not seen them, again, go to Rudin. It starts on, uh, on that. That there is a way to associate to such a function something which is somewhat close to the Riemann integral, which is called the riemann stilges integral. And uh, the riemann stilges integral associated to this function is exactly the measure, probability measure P itself. So if you are on R, you can see the integration exactly as being something like a riemann stilges integration. So it's fine, you have all the, all the nice property it's all good. Maybe I should write that, and, or maybe I should first say now something in some way more general, but essentially it would be on R, which is integration on the probability space. Essentially with an I on uh, R. I'm not going to do too much about general uh, measure theory on, uh, on a measurable set, because this would be a mess. So, okay, let us, however, start by uh, omega tp, a probability space. So, what we know how to do is we are able to measure sets. Okay, essentially, we measure all the elements which are in tau, capital tau. We know how to measure them. But you can see a set as being a function on omega through its indicator function. Some call that characteristic function. You will see why I don't like the word characteristic function when you are dealing with probability because it has a different meaning. Okay? So to a set, an event, which since we are dealing with probability, to a measurable part, in measure theory, to an event A, we associate <coughs> its indicator function call it 1A. It is a map which goes to omega to 0, 1 
I was worth telling you it is a sort of dual of the, of the Dirac measure, and we said the following, to omega, we associate the value 1a of omega is equal to 0 if omega does not belong in a and is 1 if omega belongs to a. Okay. So now we start our to integrate function. The first function we can integrate are those functions. So by definition, you see we're, we're in a good place because the measure of, ne of any set is well defined, an event that there is. It is something which is always between 0 and 1. You see it's not the Lebesgue measure on R, which is not a finite measure. This is a finite measure. so. It makes sense. So you can integrate by definition the integral of um, the 1a uh, dp of, of our omega is simply the value p of a. In the way you start to define that. And then you want this to be linear. So you can take finite linear combination of such function and you can integrate them. So in any case on the vector space generated by uh, the functions 1a if you have a finite linear combination of such function you can associate the integral. We define the integral to be linear and of course and satisfy this. So from the measure we are able to integrate anything which is a step function. Then now it depends how rich is your set. What else can you integrate? In any case, starting already with this function, which are the sort of elementary function, you can do a lot of things. If you look, for example, at the book, uh, if you don't know anything about probability, I don't think it is the, the right way to learn probability, but it's interesting. There was very big effort which was made by Albert Stern and Roth to say, OK, if you don't know anything about probability and you are interested in probabilistic number theory, how can you manage? And they manage essentially by working only on those functions. Not difficult to, to introduce. Uh, well, this is a, this is a sort of challenge to, to do that, but, but it's fine. I mean, you, you can learn something about, about probability theory there. So I, I don't want to, to do anything more here. But in the case of real numbers, then we can do more, of course, and then we have something which is definitely the riemann stieltjes integral. Okay? If omega is r, then we can extend this. The integral can be extended Riemann Stilges. I'm not going to, to tell you anything about that because otherwise it's just a course on, uh, on measure I'm going. Riemann Stilges integral. Again, I was looking, look at Rudin and uh, you'll find what, uh, what is needed for that. You find it uh, can be extended and at least to be extended at least, even more than that, not only to the step functions but also to any bounded continuous function. Of course, to any step function as in any place, but also to any bounded continuous function. You can integrate any bounded continuous function. Uh, you know what you do. You see, if you have a probability measure, 
it means because of the fact that you have this condition, it means that if you are too close to infinity or too close to minus infinity or too close to plus infinity, it's just peanut. So essentially everything lives inside something which is bounded. So you are in something which is compact. Now if you are in something which is compact, then you are very happy because you know that self functions, uh, any continuous function is a uniform limit of, uh, of step functions. Okay, this is essentially what you need for, for doing that and going to the limit. Okay? So you just cut, forget about the edges and uh, do that and, uh, and you have the, the limit which, uh, which exists. Just follow that. Okay. Uh, okay. <coughs> so again, as you know, the, wh what you would do is to do something. We start with functions which are positive functions. Then you, you can go to the, to the limit uh, upwards, for example, or to uh, squeeze them into two-step function, the continuous function. And then what you do is to say, oh, if I know how to do with a positive valued function, by linearity, I extend it to any real function. And if I have complex function, I take also the, com the imaginary part and the real part, and then you do it. Okay, so you can, this is definitely any bounded continuous function with value, with complex value, it's fine. Good. So I think I don't write all that I've written there. This is fine for us. Okay, so now uh, something a bit different uh, is uh, complex random variables. Usually you don't see that really. What you see is a real uh, complex variable and this is the most interesting because real complex variable will give you measures on the real numbers and we know what it is. But for us, you see, uh, well, what I was explaining yesterday is that we start with arithmetic functions and associate to this arithmetic function some probabilistic model. But arithmetic functions may have values which are complex values. So if they have complex values, well, fine, use a, use a probabilistic model with a complex random variables. Okay? So this is why we need to say something about complex random variables. We cannot go too far with that. You see, we cannot go to some limit which will tell you that you have something which is the um, uh, central limit theorem or something of the kind. Then it is two-dimensional, it's uh, much more complicated. But at least we can get something which, is, which tells you that you are close to the center, something of the kind, if you know that the variance is not too large, you are close to the center, uh, Chebyshev inequality is okay for those random variables. And this will be the case for, in some way for uh, Turan Kubilius, which is our first step, which is to say that the, uh, the, the variance in the real life is not worse than the variance in the model. If your real life is already complex function, you need to have something about a complex random variable and what is their variance. So be careful, don't go too far with this, but just uh, make some exercise, it is more or less what you know. But. Okay, first of all, what is the role of a uh, random variable? So random variable, it can be with value in many different things, but uh, here we are looking at value which are complex. Of course, if it is real, it's fine. Complex doesn't mean that it doesn't have to be real. Okay, so a complex random variable X is a map from omega TP to C. I should say a measurable map, which means that as soon as I have any part of C, when I take the pullback by X, it is something which is in T, and so I can take its measure. Okay? So, such that 
you see, such that uh, well, it is said here, for any part of C, then the pullback of A belongs to T. You see what is the, the pullback? By the way, this is interesting. Uh, the, the probabilist have a, another way to write this. Because if you want to understand what is the pullback, it is interesting. It is something that, what does that mean? This is indeed the set of all this omega in capital omega such that x of omega belongs to A. This is the definition of the pullback. So probabilists don't use this notation usually, and they don't use this one because this one is quite heavy. So what they do, they do the following. They say, OK, well, omega is in omega. This we know. Uh, you know uh, Fernand Reynaud, ici on vend de belles oranges pas chères. There, there's, there's some, uh, <coughs> some guy who was famous some years ago, Fernand Reynaud, and who has a, a certain number of, uh, of stories. And uh, there was a guy who was selling oranges, and he was putting a poster saying, here we sell uh, very nice and cheap oranges. And then people come one after the other and say, uh, well, of course you know that, uh, that it is oranges. Why you uh, erase that? Here, of course you are not making it for the neighbor. Erase that. Uh, you are selling. Of course you are not giving. Erase that. And they are beautiful. Of course, they have to be beautiful. And they are, not che and they are cheap. OK, erase that. So we are just doing that. We say, OK, this is obvious that we, we are in omega. Forget about that. We know also that this is just, in some way, a mute symbol. Forget about that. Well, why do you leave dots? There is no point to leave dots. Why do you, why do you leave uh, parentheses? Well, OK, this is, this is the way a probabilist will describe the pullback. So it doesn't mean something that a function is belonging to a set, but it just means that this is exactly the set of omega such that x of omega belongs to A. And of course, it makes sense in the real life if you think that you are throwing two dice and you are saying what is the probability that the sum of the dice is equal to 6 or that the sum of the, si the dice is an even number. Well, you are saying what is the probability that the sum is an even number. Okay? So of course, if you have something now which is uh, x minus 1 of a singleton. Well, you are not going to write it like that. You are saying x is equal to a. Okay, with this notation, if you are saying what is uh, x minus 1 of minus infinity t, well, this is just the set uh, x at most t. OK, so this is just the, the way to write the, the pullback. Think of that. Good. So now what we know with that, and of course the notation, so we said that we have that. Now what is interesting is that this set, we know how to measure it because we're in, a, in our probability space here. So in some way, what you want to say is that, OK, now if I take some A which is in C, I can say what is the measure of this element A which is in C with respect to x. And we define in some way. So the uh, random, a random variable. Uh, introduces a probability measure px on c. Of course, it is especially interesting if you are in R, because if you are on R, you have a better knowledge. But for the time being, you can put it on c in the following way. You say that the probability of x of a well, you are just taking something in C. You are taking its pullback. It is now in omega. 
And since it is omega, you can compute it. So this will be the probability of x belongs to A. OK, now you have two schools, which is to say, in this notation, we can be a bit more economical. Either you forget, there is no point to put parentheses and curly brackets. Brackets and curly brackets, you can simplify it. So you will see denoted as probability x belongs to A. Usually, this is the way it is done. But if you want to remember that we are really measuring set, better you write or the probability that x belongs to A. Nothing is serious here. Okay. So the reason, or I think the reason you are starting with this p x a for this instead of a probability space is that you don't know the probability space and you want to know about the probability space. Yeah. So Ex from these assumptions. Essentially, what we say is that if you have simply a measurable map, a measurable map permits you to transfer the probability, a measure, into a measure on the image space. No. In, in, why, uh, in, other, in this things, we start with this uh, priorities and. Oh, this is not. This has nothing to do with uh, with number three. Okay, sorry. Yeah, but. Uh, I don't we don't have the probability space well defined, and we are trying to know about the probability space. We have some realistic assumptions about this probabilities. Uh, yes, in some way, if, if we want, you see, the, the, the model will be, the, the point is that we are going to compare different uh, random variables. So, uh, but they, they are on the, on the same space. So, in some so ways, it's not. What I was trying to say is that we do not start with the probability distribution because we don't know it exactly. What yeah. we know is some heuristic, like they are independent heuristic. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay, you're right. This is the, the point is the following that you have two things which are different. One thing is the uh, definition. I, I will put a definition, but you have two things. You have one thing which is a map, this map into C, let us say. You have something very complicated, you throw a dice and you get something which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay? Knowing exactly what is this function is something very complicated. But what is usually interesting is not to know how it is done, but the probability that you get a 1 is 1, 6. So what is important is not this function itself, but what is important is that this I didn't prove it, but that it is a probability measure, this is an exercise. So definition, the probability measure Px is called, I don't insist that it is on C because it can be also on R, it will be interesting, is called the law. of the random variable x. Uh, you have to understand something that people were doing probability starting in the 17th century. But uh, essentially it is called Mogorov. And this is not that long ago, it's less than one century ago. Around 1930, we introduced this, all this saying, by the way, measure theory is a very good theory for getting a setting for probability theory. And this is why you have special vocabulary, special notations, which are not the notation of measure theory, but the objects are exactly objects of the measure theory. So in, uh, in measure, you would say this is the measure Px, which is the image of the measure of in omega by the function x. And uh, here we call that the law of this random variable. We don't call that a measurable function, we call that a random variable. We don't call that the, the, the measure, we call that the law. But, but it is. So in some way, this is much, uh, you see, if you know completely this function, you know everything. 
you know this. If you know the law, you don't know the, the, the function itself. There's all the question about independence or not independence or whatever. You, you may have different, uh, different random variables which will give the same law. Uh, okay, I think it's fine. Uh, yes. Okay, let us consider, go, go back to our case when you are dealing with real. By the way, we are just going to integrate with real <coughs> functions, even if they come from the complex side. It's a bit complicated that, but uh, okay, you'll see it in a, in a few minutes. Oh shit, the time is going very quickly. Okay, if x is a real random variable, this was what is important, then x is integrable Uh, if and only if the function identity from R to R is, in, is dpx integrable with respect to this measure, is px integrable if you wish. And when you are looking at what is the integral, so you are, this is a function on omega, so you can integrate it with respect to p on omega. This will be the integral of this function. But what you are doing is you are doing the following. You have omega. You are going to r by your random variable. So you are transferring the measure here. And now what you want to do is indeed to integrate it. And so you want to see the value you get when you integrate here. And to get exactly the same map, here you put the identity. So instead of integrating something which you can see as being x, and then you make the composition with the identity, you are simply here now where you transfer your probability, and what you are integrating here is the identity function. So this will be the same thing at the integral of r of the identity function, which usually we denote by d dpx of t. This being now, we are on r, so this is well understood in some way, because this is understood as being the riemann stilges integral associated to the distribution function of x. Okay? So this is in some way the mean value, the expectation, you get it like that. Okay? So, now what you get, there is some definition we are going to give. So, if it turns out that if x is a complex variable such that real part of x and imaginary part of x are integrable, then x is integrable. This is just a question of linearity. And you have the following and the integral of x dp is simply the integral of the real part of x dp plus the integral of the imaginal part of x dp. So in some way we're just integrating random, random variables which are real. So you don't have to understand exactly what is the image on C. This you will never see. We're just interested in that. Real part of x, imaginal part, uh, this is not true but if you put an i it becomes true. Okay, this is fine. Now, if x is integrable, then what you call the definition, the integral if x 
is integrable, then uh, the integral x dp is called the expectation of x and denoted by expectation of x. Okay, and if you want to know what it is, this is the expectation of the real part plus i time the expectation of the imaginary part and, uh, and you're happy with that. Only real variable. So, for the expectation it is linear. By the way, you can take the expectation of a random variable which is a vector random variable. There is no problem about that. Okay. Fine. Next step. If x square and definitely I put the absolute value, the modulus, because it is the square of the modulus. It is a real random variable, it's not the square. If you are dealing with real random variable, just put the square, it is enough. You don't need to take the absolute value square. For complex functionality, the absolute value of the of the modulus and so this is a real random variable and so I can say what it is if it is re uh, integrable etc is integrable then x itself is integrable you know how you prove that magic word there's one magic word in mathematics Cauchy Schwarz yeah there's Cauchy Schwarz Integrable integral of p is at most modulus of p is at most integral of one to power one half. And you are happy because one is integrable. You are dealing with probability measure, finite measure. So one is integrable times the integral of p square, and you are happy to power one half. So this is Cauchy-Schwarz, and uh, of course, again, if you expand it this random variable x minus a of x so e of x has a meaning because x is integrable and this is also integrable this is integrable so it does not exist always but when it exists we denote it by by a variance of x Okay, and uh, this is called the variance. Uh, we denote it by v of x is equal to the expectation of. Ah, we denote it. We denote its integral. Its, its integral by this exponential of x e of x square, and call it the variance of x. And what we have is the following exercise. We can do that tomorrow morning. V of x is what you expect. It is the expectation of the modulus of x square minus the modulus of a of x square. Well known in the real case, but it's true also in the complex case. And for us, this will be enough because we have the Chebyshev inequality. And again, this will be, I keep that for exercise theorem. So it is Chebyshev. Some call it Chebyshev bien aimé. Of course, in France, in France we call it bien aimé Chebyshev. Let x, you see, this always is Buniakovsky and uh, and uh, Bonferroni and all this uh, 
things. Let x be square integrable. With actual class accent. Let x, even even in the uh, in English books, you see it as you, you see this bien aimé arriving. It's not only in the French books. Let b a square integrable uh, random variable, and u be a positive real number. Maybe strictly positive would be better strictly positive, then we have the following, that the probability that x minus e of x square, and I keep it with the, with the square of the modulus, I don't take the, the square root, larger than u square v of x, this is at most 1 over u square. But the proof is the the same as in the, in the real case. So it tells you that even if you have something which is a complex random variable, well, the distance to its expectation cannot be too large with respect to the variance. If you, if you are in the real case, you take square root of that, you can also take square root of that. This is positive. It is the integral of something positive. You can take, but it doesn't mean really much in the complex meaning, but for real place it means really something, it is called the standard deviation. It is the deviation, how far you are from the center, but it is measured in the same unit. If x is in centimeter, this is square centimeter, but this distance without the square will be in centimeter, and you would like to express the distance with respect to something, to something in centimeter, this is the standard deviation. This it is homogeneous. So it is the same thing as in the real case, but it tells you something like that. And you remember what I was telling you about uh, Turan Kubilius or what we want to say? What we want to say, okay, that if we are in the real case, we are going to mimic, think of the Turan proof of the Hardy Ramanujan um, inequality for omega. Well, you have to do something like that. So you have to compute E of x. Usually this is easy. In the, in the model, but you have to compute v of x. And you remember v of x was a bit long. We didn't do that yesterday, we did it this morning and it took some time to, to do it. Not that complicated, but you have to do it. And what, is it, what Turan Kubilius tells you is that in your probabilistic model, well, compute that, this is easy, you build the model more or less out of this, and this you get almost for free. The v of x in the real life will not be really worse than the v of x in the model. So you compute the v of x in the model, you are happy. And immediately from that, you say, OK, my random variable will not be too far. My arithmetic function will not be too far from the mean value. So it is a way in some way to go to something which will be the normal order. Okay? Saying that what you were suggesting, one of you were suggesting, to say usually the normal order should be something like the expectation. Okay? If you are dealing with the additive function, this is, this is about okay. Good, basic notions is over. We can go to, there are some questions. Of course, I, I went very quickly about uh, what is integration. It's not a, a course on, uh, on integration, but essentially what we are going to do is only to integrate the image and to, to integrate it on R. And so this we are in something, some place we know, I mean, Riemann still just with respect to, on R, it's, uh, it's okay. Okay, so, now we enter the real business. Okay, so chapter two. Which is somewhat long in some way because this will be really the heart of the multiplicative part. That is to say, we go to Turan Kubilius and some application. Arithmetical function f 
and probabilistic models. So if you want to breathe a bit, we start with naive probability. How do you are naive in English? You put two dots on the I or you put one dot? One dot. Naive probability on N densities. So, okay, what we would like to say is something, you see, when we're looking at sets on which a function takes uh, this kind of value or something like that, you, you see that if we have a finite set, it has not big importance. Okay? So, what we would like to have to formulate statements like this, like those, no, these, these, no, no, yeah. Okay, first, let us say let A be a sequence of integer such that the probability of an integer to be in A is P of A. Okay? We like to have such a probability. What are the what are the conditions we would like to have? So so that this probability is we would like to have We would like to have something of the following kind. If A delta B is finite, then P of A is equal to P of B. So what is this? This is the symmetrical difference. That is to say, this is the elements which are either in A but not in B, or the elements which are in B or not in A. So it means that essentially A and B coincide up to a finite set. This is what it means, that this symmetrical difference is finite. So that is to say A and B coincide except on a finite set. And we like to say, OK, to be on this set, it will be about the same thing. Uh, to be in the even integer, in the even integer which are larger than 100, if we are looking in very general thing, it should be the same. We don't care much about finite set. OK, so now there is a problem with that. What is the problem? Hmm? Any, yeah, then it means the following, that for any finite set, problem, for any finite set, The probability finite set uh, f, no f, we have already f, h. Okay. Then p of h is equal to 0. Okay. Yes, but the probability is sigma additive. So if the, pro and the integers is countable. So if the probability of every element is 0, then the probability is 0 everywhere. It's not a probability. Okay. But P is sigma additive. Okay, so this is this will ruin our business. Good. Now there's something else we would like to have. I say like those, these, and uh, it is a plural, you have a second one, which will tell you that we we'll like to say the, f the following: that uh, 
Okay? We wish to say that the probability of an integer ah, we start to do to do some some number theory. The probability of an integer to be divisible by prime number p is 1 over p, or even by an uh, integer a is 1 over a. Okay, or even the probability that any arithmetic progression modulus with a difference d is something like 1 over d. Aha, uh -huh. there, there is a problem here. Again, the same kind of problem. Why? It's a bit, a bit more sophisticated to get refutation, but of course this is number theory question, so the answer will be something like a number theory thing. Okay. Let a, a and B be co prime. Then of course what you would like to say is that then the probability to be divisible that integer divisible by A and B is the intersection of the both is the same thing as to say because they are co-prime to say that it is divisible by A and to be divisible by E should be the probability that it is uh, divisible by A and B and so this probability should be 1 over AB which is the probability to be divisible by A times the probability to be divisible by B. So in some way what we are saying that if we have a nice probability like that, simply to be divisible by A is 1 over A, then to be divisible by two co-prime integers are two independent events. Okay, this should be in, in our model. What is the problem now? Good. Uh, let us write Uh, n sub a to be the elements which are not divisible by a. The elements which are not divisible by a. I don't say co-prime to a, I say not divisible by a. Then of course in our model you know that the probability of the complementary set this we know what it is. It is 1 minus the probability of the set and so this would be 1 minus 1 over A. And of course you know that if A and B are co-prime, to say that two sets are independent or to say that the complementary are independent is the same thing. You have to work a bit on that but this is not very, there is nothing difficult about that. And what you have is that the probability of N, A, N, B, intersection N, B, should be n minus 1 over a, n minus 1 over b, whenever a, b are co-prime. Set are independent, the com complementary set are independent. Good. Now something interesting, and this is an increasing thing. So if I take, let m be an integer, and n be larger than m. What I say the following, that m is included in the intersection when p is larger than m and less than n if I want a finite set of np. What does that mean? That means simply that if I take primes which are larger than m, then m is not divisible by p. Okay? So now I can go to the probability of this business. And so I have the thing that probability of m, since it is increasing the probability, this is less than, at most, the probability of this intersection m between p between m and n of n 
p. Okay? But we know that those are independent event. And so this will be the probability. I mean, I made it for two, but for a finite set, it's, uh, it's uh, the, the same thing. This will be the probability. This will be the product. Sorry? Yeah, this is. A, yeah. yeah, the complement will be also independent. And, uh, can prove that this will be this. This is only finite, so this is not a problem. Yeah. Sorry? Yes, if you wish. Yeah, you can do that that way if you wish, or go directly to this uh, independence, or do it by saying it is the one which I into and uh, okay. In any case, since it is finite, you have no difficulty with that. Now you see what happens is that if you let n tend to infinity, this is true for any n, if you let n tend to infinity, what you get here is an infinite product which di diverges to zero. The only thing we need is to know that the sum of the inverse of the prime numbers is, uh, is uh, divergent. And this is essentially due to Euler. Which is the Euler proof of uh, infinitely that there are infinitely many prime numbers, showing that the series is divergent, much more than Euclid, by the way, in this proof. So okay, and this tends to zero when n tends to infinity. Fine. So this means that this is equal to zero, and now we conclude as before. Okay. But I see that uh, uh, no, oh, yeah, it's okay. We still have time. Good. So we have some time to say to something about densities. So probability in the real world are not that great. It may be a good model, this is the point, but it's not good. If, if the reality was already something probabilistic, we just do it in the real life. No point to go to a model. Okay. So I was announcing something about densities. So okay, probability would be to put the same weight everywhere, or to put a weight with the global sum which is equal to one. Take weights with a divergent sum. Ha <laughs> ha. So what we do is the following. Now consider I am entering the second part of this uh, this section. Consider uh, lambda to be a family of lambda n such that the lambda n are positive. Usually they are. You may, you may admit that some are zero, but you don't care. In any case, non negative or positive, and that the summation of the lambda n is plus infinity. Okay, the series diverges. Yes? Yeah, again, because, because, yeah. Oh, yes, because, again, if you have a probability, and if you have a probability such that for any integer, the probability is zero, then since it is sigma additive, the probability will be zero everywhere. It's not the same thing if you have something which is non-countable. You see, you have, for example, the Lebesgue measure, which will give something, even on 0, 1, if you want to have a probability measure, it will tell you something that the probability of any point is 0, but it doesn't mean that the, that the global probability is 0. But of course, R is not countable. This is, the, this is the problem. But here we are dealing with something countable. N is countable up to now. Yeah, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see what we are doing now with that. So these are weights, and we are doing the following. If we have for A included in N, 2A included in N, we associate the following sum, which is the sum 
when we call that d lambda a up to x. What I do is I am measuring a belonging to a of lambda a and I divide it by the sum when n is up to x of lambda n. Okay, so this I call in some way sort of frequency with respect to my weight lambda n. Good. So this is the definition and now when x tends to infinity, so of course this is always between 0 and 1. This is a good point. Because the weights are positive and here you are just taking a little, a little part of everything, it depends what is A, but you are just taking all the elements here are taken from that. So this is something which is positive and which is at most 1. Good. Now it may have a limit or not and you can always define uh, d lambda of a plus is the limb soup when x tends to infinity of d lambda a x and similarly d lambda minus of a blah 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 is the limb inf. So those are the density with respect to the weight lambda n. There are essentially two ones which are of interest and even maybe one for us which is of interest. Lambda is the set 1, 1, 1. Or in the end, lambda n is equal to 1. So what we are looking at is the following d lambda of a and x, what it is. You are just counting, since you have a weight which is 1, you are counting the elements of a up to x. So this is the cardinality of the set which belongs to a and which are at most x. And we are dividing by the weight of all the integers up to x, which is 1 over integral part of x. Okay? And you are looking whether it has a limit or not. Well, of course, when you are looking whether it has a limit or not, forget about this. It will be 1 over x times that, or you stop only at integers, or you do something like that. And you have the usual notion of natural density. Natural lower density, if you take the limb soup. Natural upper density, if you take the limb... Uh, lower density if you take the limb int, upper density if you take the limb soup, and natural density if both exist and are equal. If both are equal, they always exist. Okay? So this will lead to natural density. In this case, we do not write lambda. d of something or d plus of something or d minus of something of a set, it is just the natural density. Something wrong. It's okay? You are counting with this weight. Another weight which may be of interest, we'll maybe discuss a bit tomorrow morning about that, is lambda n, uh, lambda n, let us say, for any n, lambda n is equal to 1 over n. So you take a lower weight when you, when you go when the elements are larger and larger. You are closer in some way with this notion to something that would be convergent. But of course the sum is divergent, but this sum diverges slower than the other one. Okay, so you are in some way closer to the, to the model and more should be, should be true, except that it is a bit less natural to have this. But this exists and uh, it's called a logarithmic density. So what it is? Well, d lambda of a of x is not too complicated to see what it is. It is essentially, then I am going to say, what is the sum, the global sum of all the elements, 1 over n of 2x is 1 over log x. And for the limit, it will be enough, you see. Instead of saying this is exactly the sum up to integral part of x of 1 over n, to say log x when you go to the, to the infinity for limb soup, for limb in, for the limit, it will be the same thing. 
This is why I don't care much about that. And then you will have something which is the sum when A belongs to A and A is at most X of 1 over A. Okay? Well, it has some advantages on the other one that it is easier to get a limit. As soon as you have a limit here, you have, you have a density, you have a density here, but you may find elements, sets for which you have, don't have a density here, but you have a density here. Think, for example, of the integer we start with a 1. They don't have a usual density because you have large blocks between 1,000 and 2,000. All those start with a 1, it's a bunch of them. If you go up to 2,000, it is one half of them. So you have many of them. But then if you go to 9,000, to almost to 10,000, you have a huge gap without anybody of that. So the density will go up and down. But this will smooth completely out the business and there is a density. So in some cases it makes sense to look at that. But essentially what we are looking at is the natural density. So just maybe to say a few just what are the good points and the, and the bad points for density? I don't open an, another chapter now, section now, but what are the good points? Well, density, at least if it exists, but otherwise you take the upper density or the lower density, density as values in 0, 1. The density of n exists always and is equal to 1. Ah, now we are happy because if d of a exists and a delta b is finite, Then d of b exists and is equal to d of a. Okay? I'm just talking about the natural density, but this is true also for the logarithmic density, but not now you, you can put a lambda in which are a bit crazy and, uh, and you may you, you may find things which are a bit different, but the density of an arithmetic progression with difference d exists. Oh, no, this is dangerous d. With difference uh, delta exists and is 1 over delta. <coughs> So you see, at least what we, what we wanted, we have it for the density. This is a good point. But of course, it's not a probability measure. This will be the bad point. <coughs> this is fine. You can do things also if you are, it is additive. Okay, uh, that is to say that if you take two sets which have uh, intersection which is zero or even finite, then the density of the union will be the sum of the densities. It's fine. Of course, bad point, you cannot have everything, of course. D is not sigma additive. Again, obvious. The density of a single element is zero. The density of everything is one. And you cannot expect to get too much that way. Another good point for the natural density, I just phrase it for the na natural density. So, another good point. This, and this is why it makes sense to have probabilistic model. Otherwise, we would be in probability directly, and there is no point to have a probabilistic model. For n, 
larger than one, consider the probability measure nu of n, which is a combination of Dirac sums, which is the sum up to capital N of delta n, direct measure at the point n. Okay, so it says the following that essentially when you want to measure an element A, what are you doing? You are just counting what is the proportion of the elements in your set A which are up to a capital N. You count the element in A which are up to N, this is what this does. It will detect exactly all the elements which are less than capital N and put a 1 each time you have an element which is less than n. And so this will tell you the following that nu a n of a, a, this will be just the density, usual density a n. This counts exactly the number of elements which are in your set up to n and you divide by n. This is quite important because this is definitely a measure we'll, we'll see quite often. Okay? And of course, D of N, D of A exists. Dirac measure, yes. What we are doing here, okay, this is interesting. You have now a few hours to think of that, why this is true. What I am saying is that I am counting, what, what I am doing when I am saying this is the of A. Well, for this one I say, okay, the element N belongs to A. If I look at all these sums, I say how many elements in A are less than capital N. And I divide by N, and this is exactly the definition of D of A N. Okay? And so what we are saying now is that D of A exists if and only if, but I mean this is trivial, limit when n tends to infinity of new n of A exists. Uh, you see what we are doing here now is try to find something which are some sort of probability measure and take a limit of them. So this will be all the case to know now what is the convergence of probability measure and uh, we'll make some exercise before that but uh, tomorrow morning and uh, then we'll, uh, we'll definitely, I think it is what we are going to do is to go to weak convergence. Okay? We'll recall a bit what is that about and we'll go to the convergence of probability measure. Okay, we stop here for today.